I'm like a big bad boy military guy. I'm like going, wait a minute. Well, and back then too, therapy it was not cool. Was not cool. No, no, no. Marriage therapy wasn't cool. That was like on the edge of getting out. Yeah, there, exactly. You know? so, what have I done? What is this going to end? That's probably what you're thinking. I'm thinking, right? what the heck happened? Yeah. Welcome back to part two of my interview with my coach and mentor. David Winford will continue the story of how he became one of the most prolific and profitable business coaches in the world. Again, as always, listen for an action that you can take, something you can do based on what Winford has said, and you'll make what he says a part of your life. As a reminder, in part two, we will occasionally be addressing the topic of a deeply personal loss of a loved one to cancer. We handle it in a sensitive way, but I just want you to be aware in case uh, this is something that might be difficult for you to listen to. Uh, Also, as you listen to this episode, always, always look for something you can do. If you do something this week as a result of what you've heard from David Winford, you'll make him a part of your life forever. We now continue with part two of the episode. All right, so let's switch gears from the business coaching for a bit. We'll come back to that. But one of the things that I try to do with this show is interview people who have balanced success, Mm -hmm. right? So not just people who are focused on money, not just people who are focused on career, but people who have fun and have a balanced life and spend time with family and kids. Mm -hmm. So where in the journey did your kids, we talked about your wife, where did they come into this story for you? Well, I have two kids. Okay. We're not kids now, they're young adults. Yeah. So my wife and I decided we were going to build a family and we started building a family. And as I said to you earlier in the interview, you know, my father wasn't around and my wife has a very stable family, you know, mother, father, still married 64 years or whatever it was. Yeah. And, and her family is from the Ukraine. Is that correct? Her family migrated, yeah, immigrated from the Ukraine. This is 1974. So it was a long time ago. So their core was very tight. And it was important for me and my wife when we were deciding that we're going to have a family that we were, you know, I was going to be around for my kids and do those kinds of things. And so, again, I got lucky because my wife is, you know, four or five rungs above my ladder at the time I met her. You say that. What? Uh, I mean, you, you're pretty high up on the ladder yourself. Well, again, at the time, you know, I was just a military guy just trying to make my way through there. My wife was already an educated lady, already could have picked any guy on the planet. I mean, she's sure. gorgeous, beautiful, smart, all those kinds of things. And I just didn't say no. I wouldn't let her say no to me, right? So <laughs> Because that's your one of your gifts. Is uh-huh. I just kept on rolling. Positive yeah. persistence. Positive persistence. And later she said she had to surrender to me. So that was that. Right? <laughs> and so, you know, we decided to have kids. And when we did that, I, it was important for me to, to say I was going to be there. So that led into the fact that I, I needed balance in my life. While I enjoy what I was doing and... It just wasn't my whole life. Mm. You know, like I'm, I can proudly and happily say I coached both my kids' sports all the way through, coached football, lacrosse. I coached them all. You know, I did swimming for a while. I did the girls' lacrosse because I got a girl and a boy. So I did both sports girls' soccer, boys' soccer. I did it all. Didn't miss a game, didn't miss anything because those yeah. things were important to me. So let me tie this to you because I say it a lot to my own clients. I think our first business, if you really want to think about it, our first business is our family. Wow. Yes. Okay? If your first business is not squared away, then it doesn't matter what uh, the other businesses are going on. You know, and I was fortunate enough, again, as a young guy coming up, you know, when I started, I was a younger guy. I was 28 years old, 29 years old. So the older guys, my clients were older, much older than me. So I would hear these stories, you know, like, yeah, I've been working for 25 years. I've had this business 25 years. I've been through three divorces, you know, and all of a sudden I'm thinking, well, dang, how's that successful? Why are you saying you're successful? If you're, you know, if your family's not attached and you're not involved in your family, it's more about the business that didn't make sense. And so I still say this today, your family is your first business. Mm. And so I just approached it that way. And you know, my wife and I were married for for 31 years. We were together for 34 years. Sadly, I lost my wife a year, year and a half ago to cancer. So we had battled cancer for the last five or so years. So she's no longer here with me. But all the way through, it was important for us to go on date nights. It was important for us to go on holidays together, just the two yes. of us. It was, it, it, you know, and when I'm saying those kinds of things, those are things that were fun for us. As a couple. Right. You both were yeah. mutually deciding it. Yeah. Which, by the way, I just want to insert something as a business coach, and I'm mm-hmm. sure you've seen this. Sometimes one person dominates it. 
Yeah. Right. They're like, this is what I like to do. And so they mm-hmm. both doing it, yeah. do it. I think you should have something personal that you like for fun. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But then also something that is a couple you mutually agree on. You both want mm-hmm. to do. I and, agree with you. Yeah. So we would do our things, you know, there'd be girl trips that she'd go on girl trips and I'd go on guy trips. You know, we would do those kinds of things, but my wife and I, we collaborated more than we compromised. We were collaborators. Mm. Now we learned that beautiful phrase, right? We learned that along the way, right? Because in the beginning of our relationship, you know, you're trying to get, you know, you're young, you're trying to figure out all these things about a relationship. And what you learn is that you don't have to feel like you're losing something and compromising something. If we could sit down and collaborate on, Hey, tell me what's important to you, baby. I want to hear it. Oh, and here, and she's asking you back. And so all of a sudden now you're in this collaboration together and it feels better. It feels more fun. Mm. Right. And then, of course, we took our kids everywhere. Like you guys take your kids everywhere. We took our kids everywhere. My kids are travelers now. They're, you know, they'll go off and do whatever they want to do whenever they want to do it because they just love to travel. And so uh, they're adventurous that way, too. So that's how, our, you know, again, we decided to build a family. We did that. It was important for us to, you know, it's important for me to say, hey, I need to be successful with my family before I'm successful with anything else. Yeah. And, and I think that's something that there was already that desire and tendency in me prior to us meeting because I grew up with some some parts of my family was pre- were pretty broken yeah and that was a top priority but i always your example about that oh. dr- helped drive that home for me i appreciate that and so i, I want to ask some specific questions about it because one of the things i learned from you was the structure mm-hmm. especially as a coach right developing a structure one of the principles or the systems that i borrowed from you was the idea of creating a monthly structure mm-hmm. to my coaching. Because yeah. right? most people think of weekly or daily, like these are my hours I'm going to do it this week. But instead, I started saying, I'm going to coach on the, the second and fourth, mm-hmm. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday of each month. That was something that I borrowed from you. So talk to me about how you structured your work month to allow time to have fun and have time for the family. Yeah, so I, I like the idea of the first three weeks being client meetings. Mm, okay. I'm a big believer in, you know, Friday being my, or MYOB day on Fridays, mind your own business days. Right. Which to you means? It means I just take care of whatever I want to take care of. If I don't need to take care of anything, I go play. Yeah. Uh, for, for instance, one of those, and I I did that with you one time, going to the bookstore, right? Yes. Just go oh. hang out at the bookstore for yeah. a couple hours. You remember that? I used to love it. Yeah. I still do it today. Oh, it's I great. just go to the bookstore when you find a, even I find a funky old book, bookstore. I go to the bookstore and I just randomly go to a, a different section every time. I don't go to the business section. I avoid the business section. I go, I, <laughs> yeah. because again, I've read a lot of the books in the bu- business section and ultimately I'll get there sooner or later, but I like to go explore the other things. So I created an idea that says, Hey, I'll, I'll do these things on a monthly basis. It's the first three weeks. Ultimately, it turned into first and third. Yeah. Right. And then I would just let, if something missed, I'd let it fill in on the second week, meaning if a client had to move a meeting or whatever, it'd fill in the second week. But I, ve- I tried very hard for that fourth week. Nobody moved, with, it moved in the fourth week. Yeah. And I tried very hard and it worked for the longest time. I have one client that's been with me for 25 years. He's on a Friday just because he's a special guy because he's 25 years, right? Right. So I let him do it on the Friday. But I let him know every time, hey, bro, you know, it's Friday. <laughs> hey, you give, you me, know, give yeah, me I give me, give me, I said, you know, this is my, you know, mind your own business day, you know, in my own be, be. And he goes, yeah, I know, I know, I greatly appreciate it. But his situation is a little different. So I, I let him fringe on that. So I want to clarify, though. Yeah. What you're saying is you set up your coaching meetings because mm-hmm. you, for most of your clients, you're meeting two times per month. Yeah. So you were setting those to, up to occur on the first and third Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday yeah. of the month. Of the month. And that was creating structure that allowed you to mentally focus mm-hmm. on your clients during mm-hmm. those weeks. Mm-hmm. And then what you said occasionally there were exceptions, but on the second week, once you made that change, what were you doing during week two? In the beginning, I was um, cold calling. I okay, there we go. Bus- I was driving business, mm. right? I was trying to get business, pick up business leads and things like that. Now I could just have, I, I may not have anything to do, right? I may not have any kind of calls. Right. Or again, somebody will ask me to speak to somebody or something and I I book it in that second week. If I'm going to go on site, like here I am with you, but I'm piggybacking with another client in the area. It's in the second week, right? Of the month. Yeah. Right. There's so much freedom that comes from that. People Mm -hmm. sometimes look at that and they go, oh, it's too structured, but it's actually the opposite. I'm with you. It creates freedom for you to be open to things and... 
and, and to leave the rest of the time open, right? Like that fourth week. Yeah. You I, know you can yeah, count on it. Absolutely. I agree with you. People ask me that and they say, oh, that's very rigid. I said, I tell you what, I'm the most flexible guy on the planet Earth. Yes. You call me up and you ask me to do something. I will immediately look at my calendar and I will give you the answer right then and there. How free is that? <laughs> I love it. Yes. Right? How free is that? Well, and I've never at any time, I mean, there have been times we've had both an official coaching relationship mm -hmm. and a mentorship and mm -hmm. a friend relationship. Mm -hmm. Never at any time was there a doubt in my mind that if mm -hmm. I needed to talk to you about mm -hmm. something important, that you wouldn't be there for me mm -hmm. that day. Yeah. Even though you had all this structure. Yeah. And that is the result mm -hmm. of that buffer and that schedule that you've created for yourself. Yeah. Because we created standard with ourselves. I say, hey, if you're going to ask me to meet with you and you want to meet with me that day, tell me you want to meet me with that day and then give me a couple of times. When you ask me, that's what you usually say. Hey, is there a way I can speak with you today? And, you know, if you're open to the time, you'll just say I'm open. And then therefore I'll fill my own calendar and say, hey, will this work for you or will this work for you? That's our language with each other, right? But that's our system that we've agreed upon with each other. But it's not just with you. I do it with all my clients. Right. Right. So I tell my clients, hey, listen, you have to move the meeting. Don't be a knucklehead and tell me I'm just moving the meeting and don't give me two dates and times. Well, and that's the other part of it too. Yeah. I'm glad you brought that up because also part of what we do, mm -hmm. and I'm saying we, cause I, I got this from you yeah. was within the contract itself and within the agreement that we mm -hmm. have with our clients, at least with mine, it was 72 hours. You've got to give me 72 hours notice mm -hmm. if you're going to move it or you forfeit it. Yeah. And we're not doing that to be hard on people. Mm -hmm. We're doing that to help them learn how to take control of their schedule. Because otherwise what happens is – what happens to everybody? Oh, something came up. Oh, this thing happened. My employee had an issue. My uh, This customer needed something. I've had things – and tell me if this is – you've experienced this – where – I tell the client, look, you can take care of your customer right now, but if you do, you're going to forfeit this meeting. Mm -hmm. And then they go to the customer mm -hmm. and they say, I'm sorry, I have a prior commitment. And what does the customer say? That's fine. Yeah. And then they schedule it a different time. Mm -hmm. So I'm assuming that's the same sort of thing. Like yeah. you've got that structure with them to teach them how to take control of their time. Yeah. Because again, the toughest thing is no one wants to say no. Mm -hmm. Right? Yes. So I just teach them and says, listen, you don't have to say no. You have to say, let me check on my calendar. Yeah. And a lot of times I say, that time you're asking me, I'd love to participate. It just doesn't work for me. Would this time or this time work for you? All they want to know is that they're, you're going to work with it. Right. Work with them. They're okay with not now if they yeah. have a clear when. Exactly. That's how I put it. I, I think that's exactly the way you should, that's the way it is. And then ultimately with that kind of thinking gets back to my ultimate principle that I shared with you earlier, which is I do what I say I'm going to do when I say I'm going to do it. So... I find myself to be way more freer because I'm able to do those kinds of things when you ask me. And again, it doesn't have to, have to be business. I'll give you a total different kind of crazy thing. Mm. When you were first able to share a calendar, I shared a calendar with my wife mm. because we have personal things that were going on. Right. right? And mm -hmm. my wife would try to, would want to schedule things, but then she'd call me or I'd be on the phone. It'd be a little mess. So finally I, I was like, hey, listen, I'm going to, let's just share a calendar. I'm going to give you access to my calendar, but here's the rule. If it's in red, no moving. Any other open spot, do whatever you want to do. So all of a sudden, I'm sitting there in a meeting, and all of a sudden, I see something pop up on the screen, and I look over, and <laughs> it's my wife scheduling a dinner or some you know function or something, or, right. or, or you got to pick the kids up, uh -huh. right? Uh -huh. And it was empty, right? So I'm like, okay, it's empty. She did it. So that was another way for my wife and I to really collaborate on our life so that we could do the things that we wanted to do that were important to yeah. us. And it wasn't a back and forth or slow down or whatever. My wife could really be on the phone with somebody who was asking her, hey, we have tickets to a Bruce Springsteen concert, you know, but we got to fly to Vegas. You know, what do you think? My wife would get on the computer and look at my schedule See and it. say, hey, yes, that works or no, it doesn't work. Well, and but part of that reason, again, going back to the influence that your family had, is because she was your top priority. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, 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 yeah. And and number one business. Yeah. Well, and even <laughs> more number one. I don't know how you think of it. Uh, For me, my wife is my number one business. My marriage is my number one business. Yes. My children are my number two business. Yes. Then business after yes. that. No, I agree with you. 100%. Right. Because because that relationship, from my perspective, is forever. Mm -hmm. 
and without her, I would not have accomplished anything. I agree with you. Same way, I'm the same boat. Yeah. And also, without her, it's, it doesn't have the same amount of joy, does it? I uh, know. I lost mine, and she does not. it's not the same. You don't get to share the same thing. So it's different. And so, yeah, you do that because it, it, she's important. If she, and, th- if, and again, if, if it's really important to you, you'll do it. And again, we know that it won't matter about the hurdles. You'll figure out the hurdles if it's really important to you. And but it's easier yeah. when you schedule things. Uh, is absolutely. Not? Yeah. Well, and this is where the intersection of something that sounds as as cold as the word systems mm-hmm. me- meets up with something that is so powerful like love. Yeah. yeah. Right? Because you have, and I appreciate, by the way, we've talked about this beforehand. You're comfortable with talking about this. So I'm yeah. just so someone's listening, they're going to go, man, you're going to take this guy to a tough spot. And I'm like, well, you know, I know, I know Winfrey can handle it and <laughs> yeah. too. He gave me permission. Yeah. You have a unique perspective that not many people have now. Mm. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Because of the absence mm-hmm. of your wife. So mm-hmm. let me put this in a different way. Let's imagine that you hadn't had that structure, that you hadn't had that ability to do those kinds of fun things with her. I I don't know if I would be one of like my like some of my old clients which were regretting things. Yeah. You know, I should have. You know, maybe one day. Mm. I don't like to use those words. They're not good words for me. They never have been. I'm not a one day, someday. I'm not that kind of guy. I'm like, "Hey, do we want to do it? Let's schedule it." My wife and I would schedule out our whole co- calendar. I'm a big rock guy. So I'm going to put my big rocks in first in my calendar and my wife and my family by big rocks. So we'd have two or three big holidays planned, you know, it's sort of like what you're yeah, doing. Now. It's another thing that you yeah. inspired me. We yeah. like make vacations with family, yeah. big times off and also yeah. the small times off, right? Yeah, yeah. We were talking about how, can you give us just an insight for someone who, who can get a feel of what that relationship was mm-hmm. like with your wife? of the kind of things that you would just do that are a little spontaneous, that the structure created spontaneity. What's something that you guys would do together like that? Okay. So Saturday mornings, my wife would sleep in. Okay. But I'm an early rising kind of guy. So I would get up, move around, do whatever I'm going to do. And then I would read magazine, AAA magazine or East Bay magazine or whatever it is. I'm reading the magazine and it says, hey, there's these waterfalls in Eastern, Cal- Eastern California, you know, on the other side of the Yosemite that, you know, is wonderful, blah, 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 blah. Well, I'd go in there to my wife and say, hey, you getting up? You want me to make you breakfast? She'd say yes. And I would come in there and make breakfast. And she's making breakfast. I say, hey, do we have plans today? And she'd say, no. What do you want to do? I said, well, I read this article. What do you think? Mm-hmm. So she'd read the article. And she says, hey, that sounds like fun. That day, that moment, off we go. That's right? so beautiful. Right? I love that. Now, now, sometimes, you know, we'd take the kids, because when they were younger, we'd just take the kids with us, and it wouldn't be, you know, rafting down a river. My wife was like, we're going to go rafting down the river? I said, yeah, this magazine says we go rafting down the river. Let's go to rafting, <laughs> rafting down the river. Let's go wine tasting. Mm. My wife loved wine. So I found an article that listed the oldest wineries in Northern California. And I think there's like eight of them. And so for one weekend, we went to all eight of them. <laughs> that was our weekend. Mm. Okay. And, and so is that a good example? For, that uh, that's a beautiful for? example. And also what I love about it too is there's an element of putting your spouse first in that. Yeah. Right? Because, and I'm sure she did the same with you. I know yeah. she did some crazy things that oh, yeah. she would never have done, but you would want to do. But the idea of saying, hey, I recognize this is something my wife loves. Mm-hmm. I'm going to make it a priority to do this trip with yeah. her. To give her the experience of something she loves. Yeah. It made it fun yeah. for her. Yeah. You know, it made it, it made, I was fun, it was fun for me because I'm still going to go do it with her. But what's crazy though, was that we'd go up there and of course we do the wine thing. And then all of a sudden I'd say, you know, do we want to drive home or do you want to get a hotel? That's keeping the love in the house. <laughs> Seriously. Yes. Right. Yes. Because when my kids were older, we could call home and say, hey, listen, we're going to stay tonight somewhere. Go to your grandma's house. Or, hey, mm. we called the neighbors already. We're not going to be there. You know, they're 16, 17 years old. So it's like, you know, call the neighbors, tell them we're not going to be there. So you're going to be by yourself. No ho- no parties at the house, right? Mm-hmm. And we would stay at night. And then we'd go out and do, the, and we'd do the other one. Or because of my flexibility and my account, my schedule where I could have a, do my calls wherever I was at, sometimes I'd get my wife to say, hey, let's take off Tuesday, Wednesday and play hooky. 
So she would take off on a Tuesday and Wednesday and we would go up to where we were going and there was no crowds. We didn't have to mm. deal with the weekend stuff. Yes. That's right? the best. All right. So yeah. Because we just, we had that flexible kind of schedule where we could do that and her job. She could do that kind of thing too. We could do it all the time. Cause you know, she had to take PTO for it. Right. She, but, she, she worked for, she worked for the Cal- state of California. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So she had a little more structure than, than yeah. a guy like you. Yeah. Just, she had a lot more, a lot more structure. So she had it, yeah. but I would say, or she would, you know, part of her job was to go review some business spot or whatever it may be, some event thing, whatever. And she say, you know, would you want to come with me? I said, of course. And so I, I'd go to San Diego, I'd go to wherever where she wanted me to go. Mm. So we kept that kind of spontaneity in our, in our relationship. And we had it from the very beginning. Cause when we first started courting, I said to you earlier that I was in San Diego, she was in San Francisco. And then ultimately I, I was in Panama city. I was in Newport, Rhode Island. And I would say to her, Hey, I'm going to be in Denver at this weekend. And I, I'm going to be off. You want to meet me in Denver? Hmm. This is before we're married. Sure. Okay. So we're just courting. And she would like, you want me to meet you in Denver? I said, yeah, you meet me in Denver if you want to meet me in Denver. So we had that opportunity where we would fly and did those kinds of So it was in our relationship. It was like in our DNA. And then we just kept doing it all the way through. Right? And you continued. Again, I'm going to go back to that phrase that you use, which is mm-hmm. you collaborated more than you compromised. Yes. A lot more. I collaborated a lot more than I compromised. Yeah. It says a lot about the nature of the relationship. It also mm-hmm. says a lot of the maturity of you two. Uh, and we grew that. I mean, that wasn't something that happened from the very beginning. You know, it's a relationship right. and you're working through these kinds of things. You know, in the very beginning, can you imagine you, I never lived with a woman and my wife never lived with a man. So my wife is a free bird and here's a structured military guy come walk in the door. So I come walk in the door and my wife has this habit and she still had the habit till the day she died of drinking just a half a cup of coffee. And leaving the rest of the cup of coffee on the damn. Counter. Oh, this sounds like what I how I torture my <laughs> wife in the house. I leave the half cup, half cups of water everywhere. <laughs> so my wife will leave this cup of coffee. It's driving me crazy, right? Something you know, and I'm sure I had junk going crazy. So one, we just were having a struggle time communicating with each other. So my wife comes home one day and says, "Hey, let's go see a therapist." <laughs> okay. Right now, again, I'm like, you know, we're, okay. we're married less than a year. Right at the time, come see a therapist, and I'm like a big bad boy military guy. I'm like, oh wait a minute. Well, and back then too, therapy it was not cool. Was not cool. No, no, no. Marriage therapy wasn't cool. That was like on the edge of getting out. Yeah, there, exactly. You know? like, so what like, have I done? What is this going to end? That's probably what you're thinking. I'm right? like, what the heck happened? Yeah. So we go to the therapist. Therapist hears us out. Does like she's and she was so cool. She goes, oh, you just guys have to have a way of communicating, having a way of a timeout. And we're like, what? And they go, yeah, just have to have a symbol, create a symbol. So my wife and I created a peace sign. It's a two. Okay. So what that meant was that if I felt like I was being attacked or something, you know, or my wife wasn't hearing me and I needed space, I just hold up number two. Right. And she would back up and we'd move in a different place and then we'd come mm-hmm. back and then we'd start to collaborate. Right. Or if she held up the two, I did the same thing. Well, I want you to know it happened to me first where she held the two up first. It was the very first time it ever happened in our home where she did it first. And and when she did it, I was like, what are you talking about? I'm just talking to you. And she's like, no, you're yelling at me. I said, no, I'm not talking. I'm not yelling, but I'm yelling, right? Uh-huh. But it's just my voice of the excited voice of getting up, right? So she holds that two up. And I'm like, Wait. and she goes, you know the rules. I'm like, ah. Oh. So we separated, <laughs> right? And then when we separate, we come back together and we started laughing about it. Because what I realized was that, again, I'm trying to communicate, but the only way I know how to communicate sometimes is to be loud. And my wife just didn't hear it that way. She couldn't hear that. That was screaming at her, right? Right. And then when my wife was ignoring me or, or didn't want to, not ignore me, but when she was not, didn't want to answer it because she was processing whatever she was processing, it would drive me crazy. You know, she would have to give me the two, like, hey, I'm processing. Right. So we learned those kinds of things early in our relationship. And then we just got stronger and better at them as we grew together. And that's why I say to you, I definitely know that I collaborated way more than I ever. And you're both working together. Yes. Both helping each other. Yeah. So. Because that's love, right? You're loving each other. Sometimes, you you know, it's getting your relationship. I've been together for 31 years. It wasn't roses the whole way. Trust me. You know, no. their life is happening. Things are going on and you're working through those things together. But, um, but that's the key. Mm-hmm. You're working through it together and you both have confidence in each other that mm-hmm. you're both 
uh, love each other in love with each other yeah. and say okay yeah. i i'm working because i love you i'm yeah. i'm going to put in the effort because i want this mm-hmm. to get stronger and better yeah. and that's that says a lot about both of you that you were doing that uh, uh, and i'm going to add this one more please, thing too because I, I it's important because i coach a lot of men mm. and you know again at this stage of my career they'll ask me the younger guys will ask me well hey how does it work or how do you, you know how do you do it and I say, listen, you got to laugh. You got to find ways to laugh and have fun with each other. That's basically what we're talking about here. And then I say, I write cards. I would write my wife cards. Hmm. And I would bring home flowers every week. My wife loved lilies, right? And irises. So it's not every year, tulips and lilies is what she likes. And irises would be the third flower. But she wouldn't always have tulips because of the time of year. But I would always bring flowers to the house. And I'll share this personal thing with you, Dave. My wife saved every card. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. So it's crazy. Mm. Crazy. For after she passes, you uh, you pull up a box and it's every card you ever wrote her. <laughs> it's crazy. Oh, my goodness. Did you not know that until after? I didn't know she was saving them. I mean, I uh, thought she saved them, but I didn't know she saved every one of them from the very beginning. <laughs> Excuse me. So that's just trippy. How right? beautiful that she did that. But also how beautiful that you did that. Yeah. That she had that she was able to save that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've now seen it a couple of times in the story. There's an awareness on your part of what your partner needs and wants. And you were yeah. giving those to her. And this Try. gets to, you know, I think a question a lot of people have asked you recently. And so I hope it's not an annoying question, but I think it's important for people who are listening to this because you have a perspective that unfortunately many don't get until it's too late. Yeah, yeah. So when if you were to talk to someone who is, you know, they're at the start of their relationship or they're thinking about building relationship and you know now what you didn't know mm-hmm. prior to her passing, mm-hmm. what would you say to someone who wants to have the kind of success that you two had in your marriage? I I would say get comfortable with the idea of collaborating. Right. Don't think you got to give something up. Collaborate together. I think that would be the first thing that you have to think about. And the second, another thing I would tell people to think about is, is it is those little things that you, you'll miss, you know, I miss holding my wife's hand. Mm. I miss when she put her head, hand on my head. I miss when she called out my name. So I would tell people to cherish those things and, and don't sweat the small stuff. You know, we always sweat the small stuff. Like what? You know, do we have enough money for this or enough money for that? Question becomes, do you really need that or do you need, you know, do, you know I mean, is it really important to you? You're growing a family, you got kids and, you know, does it really matter if little Johnny's going to A school versus B school? Things, little things like that you, you know, you, that you seem to be, that, that you think are big really trivial in the end of the at the end of the game and uh, so that's what that's what i would say to people is stop using the word compromise as much in your relationship as as and use collaboration yeah so every time you want to use the word compromise ask yourself can i use collaboration here so that you consciously say okay i'm not going to compromise i'm going to collaborate well compromise is what you do when you negotiate with a Hostile party. Yeah. Right? Yeah, Collaborates so. what you do with your friend. Yeah. So, so figure it out. And so it's all those little things like I miss my wife's voice, you know, I, you know things things like that that yeah. are really, you know, uh, that are personal. Thank you so much for yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. sharing that. I know yeah. that's very difficult for you, brother. And thank yeah. you for no, I appreciate being that. candid with yeah. it. Yeah. I think it's important because, again, I get, as I shared with you, I wanted to share that one moment because I get to speak with men a lot. And even women who I have, I have several women clients and we get locked in on something and we forget what's important to us, right? We think the business is the most important thing. And to a degree, it's very important because it's allowing you to do all the other things that you want to do to have fun and uh, and travel the world or whatever it is that you want to do, put send your kids to school or whatever, Uh, you know, buy curtains for your house or whatever it is. But I think the tough part about that is that if you don't make your family the number one thing, then all the rest just doesn't really matter at the end of the day. You know, you know, I've shared with you on different occasions since my wife passed, 
what I miss the most is that, you know, um, sharing my life with someone. Yeah. It's so much better to do these things when you have someone else doing it with you. Yeah. That you love. Yeah. So share, share away. So that's that. You got me choked up over here, man. So, that's <laughs> so share away. Sorry. Yeah. It was not yeah. my goal to, to yeah, make no, you cry, I but I, I know that people listening to this are going to be very touched mm. and hopefully more importantly, they make some structural changes in their life. Mm -hmm. to really make room for what matters, whether it's your partner, whether it's mm -hmm. your spouse, whether it's your child, mm -hmm. but it's those relationships mm -hmm. that are the number one business. Mm -hmm. And you want to ask yourself, mm -hmm. how do I structure my life to make them the type priority? Everything yeah. else fills in around it. Right. I'm not asking them right now if I could have made more money. I'm asking, you know, could I have done more with my wife? Yeah. Could have gone some different places with her. Should we have gone? To, and my wife and I had a full life. Trust me, we had a beautiful, wonderful life. We went all over the world together, did all kinds of crazy stuff, funky stuff. That I was just telling you about. Yeah, it's that's the part I'm saying. Hey, I'd want I'd want to do more of that. Yeah, that's the part I missed. Okay, so now I'm going to play devil's advocate with what you said yeah, for, go for, for just it. a little bit. Yes, I recognize that you say I'm not going to make more money, but I think there's a principle in here that I learned, and maybe I learned from you, or we've mm -hmm. learned it together was the value of your value per hour. Yes, yes. Right, because a lot of people think, this is how much money I make in a year. Mm -hmm. That's the wrong perspective. It's yes, not right. about how many you make in a year, because if you're working 80, 100 hours a week, mm -hmm. what good is that all that pile of money that you get? Yeah, right. What really matters is what you're making per hour. Yeah. Can you share a little bit about what you did to maximize your value per hour so that when you work, that one hour is worth, honestly, what, $1,000 or more? Yeah, again, first of all, know your value, mm. right? Know what your worth is and say, and be comfortable saying, here's my worth, right? I, I think as I said to you earlier, you know, some, there's times when I say to guys, hey, listen, man, I, I, whatever you're paying me at the end of the year, if I don't make it four times the return, I'll work for free, right? Now, I know I'm going to make four times the return and no problem, no time, right? They don't, right? They're thinking, dang, this guy's crazy. Right. You know, but I, you have enough experience to know the value is going to be there. The value is going to be there. I'm going to bring the value. And I think the deal too, David, is to your point there, I think what you're trying to make there, it's really to shift your thinking from an hourly rate, right, to, again, what's important to you, what the value that you want to bring to it. And, yeah. what, and how much did that do you really need? You know, I, got, I love to say to guys, hey, listen, I don't need to work 40 hours to make what I make. I can do it in 10. Right. But the, okay. So what I'm yeah. saying to be clear is yeah. because you can do it in 10, yeah. that means that 10 is mm -hmm. worth four times what it would have been if you did it in 40. Yeah, absolutely. So that's what I'm saying is, is you created a structure where mm -hmm. that value per hour is so high mm -hmm. so that it gave you the freedom mm -hmm. to do those things mm -hmm. with your wife, mm -hmm. to have that kind of flexibility mm -hmm. because you chose a career, mm -hmm. first of all, that gave you that ability mm -hmm. to raise that value very high. Mm -hmm. And then second of all, you built a structure, you built the systems, the mm -hmm. process for your business so that you maintained it and built it year after year. Yeah. yeah and yeah. that gave you all that freedom. Yeah. And again, we're all looking for freedom. Right. We are. Right? Mm -hmm. I mean, entrepreneur guys are looking for freedom, but even the guy who's working is the W2 guys. Like, they want freedom and they can have freedom. They just have to shift their thinking around whatever they're doing. They can't, you know, hey, I might not be able to have a RV and, uh, and five trucks. Right. You have to be a little bit more smart about what you're doing with it. But we all have to make choices. Even a rich guy like you has to make a choice, right? You know, do I get this or do I get that? The answer to that is what's going to give me more life? Absolutely. Absolutely. That's where I was going with that. That's often what you're asking, you know, how do I get more life? What does more life mean to me? And am I serious about that? Then if I'm serious about that, then I'll go do what I need to do to make that happen. Right? Yeah. So that, you know, there's my point. Well, actually, I think this is a good point. We... In our conversation earlier today, when we were at the game, a phrase came up that I had forgotten mm -hmm. from that came from the E Myth, which is the primary aim. Oh, primary. So the primary aim, for those who are not familiar, is basically like a summary of like who I am, mm -hmm. right? So what's your primary aim? Well, my primary aim is to live deeply and have balance between my head and heart and harmony with nature, so that I can be the best man I possibly can be. So. That's it. It's about as simple How as long have you used that as a guiding statement um, in your life? 20, 28 years. And has it evolved over time? Yes, it has evolved. And the beginning when I first did it, you know, it was an exercise because I had to do it 
through Michael's business, right? It's where I learned that thing. Mm-hmm. Mine was very generic. But then what happened was I got to do it with people. And mm. the more I got to do it with people and the more I exercised that muscle, the more I realized I was cheating myself if I wasn't being true to myself, right? About what I wanted to be. Because you saw the value of it in their life. I saw the value of it and how they were using it in their life. And so to live deeply, to be alive deeply, is like you're aware of what's going on around you at all times. Again, as I said, balance between my head and heart. I get out of balance sometimes. And then I'm a guy who I know when I'm not, I'm, I feel a little twisted. I, I, it's because I'm not going out enough. I'm not out in nature enough. I'm a nature guy. I got to have it. Yeah. That was part of your, mm-hmm. your statement. Yeah. So I've got to have it. So I put it in there. And then ultimately the result I'm trying to be is the best man I possibly can be. So that's why if I'm doing all those things, I'm ultimately going to be the best man I possibly can be. So that is my aim. And now I use it to make decisions. I t- just like I ask my clients, you know, how are we going to use this to make decisions? Because we might be making a decision that's not going to be congruent with our aim. And what we find out is that as you go through that and it's not congruent with your aim, you start to get frustrated and you start to feel, you know, taken advantage of, or you start to feel like this is not the place I want to be. Right. But if you're always living within your values and always living within your principles, which is not always easy because everybody's trying out from the outside are trying to pull you away from your values and principles. Right. I mean, that's just the way the world works. Right. Someone's always trying to drag you away from those. Somehow, some way. Right. So that's how I use the aim and that's how I ask my clients to use the aim. And and then to realize that you go back, it's a breathing, living, breathing thing. So it's just not static. I appreciate you asking me, you know, does it evolve? You know, my wife passed. And so I'm trying to figure out who I am and where I'm going from this place. And I caught myself going back to this primary aim. Hmm. I caught myself going back, well, you know, who am I? Well, you know, I'm a man who wants to be deeply alive. Even though right now it, it doesn't seem like I'm going to achieve that just yet, right? You know, because of the things that happened to me recently in my life, my wife gone, you know, I'm having to shift things around. But what I've discovered is that when I keep pushing that and I keep moving myself towards being deeply alive and balanced between my head and heart and harmony with nature, right? All of a sudden now, you know, I'm out walking three times a day, mm. right? Now I'm going out and saying, you know, I'm going to go camping. I'm just going to camp by myself. You know, um, love it. Yeah. So those kinds of things. So that's how I'm using it. Well, I would just say from an outside perspective, yeah. someone who's known you for many years, yeah, yeah. I think you're pretty darn effective at that. Oh, thank you. At being deeply alive. Oh, I appreciate that. And just for one insight, yeah, yeah. Uh, someone who doesn't have the privilege, first of all, just the act of coming here and spending the weekend with my family. Yeah. Right. And it comes 100% from a place of love. Yeah. Yeah. And because we all sense that. Everybody wants you to be here. Oh, I know. Appreciate that. That's nice. And and then we went to dinner tonight, and we're leaving the the restaurant. Yeah. And you're you have to say <laughs> thank you so much. We're at a at a Polynesian restaurant, and you're saying you know thank you and delicious. 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 You're letting delicious. everybody know that's always been who you are. Yeah. Gosh, I remember going to Jamba Juice with you in <laughs> San Francisco, and you're like, "Are you having a Jamba day?" Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like yeah. that's just who you are. As yeah. you live that every day. And I, you know, I don't call it the, the primary aim these days. I think of it as victory, terms of victory. Yeah. And that, what that means is that I succeed today. Mm-hmm. I've got, there's mine right there on the wall. Yeah. Absolutely. That's it. Yeah. Change one person's life today. Yeah, yeah. I get you. That's it. If I do that, if I do that, then it was a good day it, for it's me. It's been called many things. It, it doesn't, right. I wouldn't yeah. anybody get stuck on what it is, primary aim or vision quest or, or mission, statement, mission statement, whatever, or whatever it, is. Yeah. it is, your life purpose, whatever those things are. I think again, you have to think strategically about who you want to be. And then at the end of the day, you want the people around you to be able to say, my father lived deeply. He was mm. deeply alive. That's what I want my kids to say. I think that's the key. You know, you want, because at the end of the day, when it's all over with, you know, you don't get to take anything with you. I can promise you that. And you're just going to have memories. Hopefully they're beautiful, wonderful memories. I mean, there'll be some, you know, memories that you, you know, sad ones, but, you know, hopefully most of them are beautiful moments that you like you experienced life together with because you were living that way. You were always trying to be alive. I, for me, that's just, I'm talking about for myself. Yeah. It's like me, you know, waking up on a, on a Saturday morning and reading a paper or a magazine. That's just me saying, hey, I just want to go do something fun with my wife. Let's go see what it is. You know, I can also tell you this goofy story early in our relationship. 
I was still in the military, and the gentleman we called Squirrel, Secret Squirrel, asked me to get, pick him up at the airport on a Sunday. Now, this is before cell phones. Okay. Okay. So on that Sunday, my wife and I woke up, and she says to me, let's just stay home, lock the door, and not do anything. All of a sudden, 6.30 at night, the phone rings, right? And I don't pick it up the first time. I let it just ring, and it rings and rings and rings and rings. And then it stops ringing. And then a few minutes later, it's ringing again, right? And so I decide to pick the phone up. So I pick the phone up, and Squirrel goes, hey, Winnie, how you doing? <laughs> I said, Squirrel, I'm doing okay. He says, uh, are you supposed to be doing anything today? <laughs> I said, no, I'm here with my wife, enjoying a lazy Sunday with my wife. What's, what's going on with you? He says, you were supposed to pick me up at the airport. I'm at the airport. I'm like, what? Oh, man, hold on a second. I hang the phone up. Oh, I, I, I got to go to the airport. A squirrel, a secret squirrel. And she goes, oh, my God, we forgot about secret squirrel. I run all over there pick, pick him up. And of course, I bring him to my house. He's going to stay at my house. <laughs> and so it's a funny story because yeah. there's a day that her and I were just going to do nothing. We didn't have kids at the time. We were just going to do nothing. Well, uh, so here, it ranges, right? So I'm just saying. Yeah. That. Well, and, and also then for someone who's deeply alive, then there's – I have to share this one. Mm. You told me about this when you went to Morocco. Can you tell everybody about that unique experience? That yeah. You had? So my wife and like 18 other people decided we're going to go to Morocco. Okay. And we're going to spend a month in Morocco. Wow. We were just going to take a bus and we got our own private bus and we got our private guys and we're just going all over Morocco. Well – we're in Casablanca, and I say to the guide, hey, I know you're a better one. And he's like, yeah. And I was like, can I go hang out with your family? Is, are they still like in the desert? And he's like, yeah. You want to hang out with my family? I said, yeah. I said, so when everybody goes to Marrakesh, can I go hang out with your family? <laughs> now, mind you, my wife thinks I'm crazy, right? My wife is like... <laughs> As if she hasn't figured it out yeah, yeah. by this point. Yeah, but everybody on the bus thing is crazy, right? There was only two people on the bus that knew me and my wife, and the rest were like new people that we know, right? So the rest of us were like going, what's this guy trying to do? Go to this desert. So I convinced him to allow me to go with his family into the desert for three days. And I'm working their goats, right? <laughs> They're moving the goats from one place to the next place, <laughs> Right. And I'm living with these guys for three days. And, you know, it, we could barely speak English to each other. There was bro broken language kind of thing. But what was cool was that the guide's brother who was out there could speak really better English than everybody else. So he was able to translate. So he was my translator. But, yeah, I was out in the middle of the Moroccan de Sahara Desert for three nights, three days and three nights. Um, Taking care of the goats, feeding the goats. Taking the goats, walking the goats, wherever they, wherever they His father sent me out to look for firewood. We're in the Sahara Desert. He says, tell him to go get wood, right? So the, so the young You're man, looking around. I'm like, we're in the Sahara Desert, right? <laughs> he says, go get wood. I'm thinking, what the heck is this guy crazy? So soon enough, you know, you're walking over the dunes, and next thing you know, there's this branch sticking out of the dunes, Right? You reach over there and grab the branch, and all of a sudden it's a tree, right? It's a dead tree, but it's an old dead tree that's covered yeah. up by the sand because the sand, the sand doesn't stay one place. It moves all over the place, right? So, yeah, that's the story that you're talking about. Well, the, the, and that's just one of many oh, where yeah. you just do the thing that, that maybe people think they want to do or maybe they watch a show on TV and they see someone do these mm -hmm. adventurous things. You just do them. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's another example of you living that deeply alive. But here's the question. I've asked you this before. I'm curious what your answer is now. Are you afraid of anything? I'm probably afraid of drowning. That's yeah. that's surprising from I don't think I would want to drown. I've seen guys drown. Okay. Know, and I've you know, I've seen the results. Well, someone who like made yeah, your I know, career in water it, yeah, for so many years. Yeah, because again, I know what it does, right? It freaks uh, people out. And so I would say to you if, because I'm trying to be as honest as I possibly can with it, because I could say for as long as I said no. Nothing scary. Yeah, that's what I heard yeah, maybe the yeah, first yeah. time. But I, now that I'm older and I'm much more secure about who I am with everything, I'd say, yeah, I wouldn't want to, I would not want to drown. But people and situations and new cultures, that doesn't scare you at all, does it? No. You, no, no you'll no. just throw yourself into that, whether it's working in Morocco mm -hmm. or trying 
a crazy food at a restaurant that no one in their right mind would try on, on the first time. You Dude, do. I'm in Morocco eating bull's balls. <laughs> okay? So the guy comes out, and it's a delicacy right there. Right? Sure. It sure is. I'm not trying to mess around with it. Right. So there I am at the thing, and, and – uh, they're all laughing, you know, you know, is anybody going to eat bull balls? And I'm thinking, are they for real? I didn't know. I, I wasn't, A, I didn't look at the menu and I wasn't talking to the guy at the time or to the waiter at the time. So all of a sudden, you know, they're all laughing about it. And then the guy, come, the waiter comes around me and I, I, I said, is it, are you serious? There, you, is that, he goes, oh yeah, it's a delicacy for us here. If you'd like it, we'll make it for you. And I said, is anybody else getting it? And he says, nobody else has gotten it yet. I said, well, load me up. <laughs> Right? <laughs> and so he brings them out there, and so of course he, you know, it's, right? It's but me, that's it's me. Yeah, one of many different. Yeah, things. yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, I've done a. I've done. I love to do. I love to do things that I learned a long time ago. That I think it's sort of your principle too. It, and you, I think you said it earlier. Give, give first. Yeah. yeah. So I've learned to give. So I learned when I've gone to places like. Um, like Africa, you know, I've been to Africa, I've been to Somalia, I've been to Mad Madagascar, I've been to Kenya, and I would always try to find out what the locals needed. Mm. So we're going to Kenya, and I call the embassy in San Francisco, I call the embassy, the Kenya embassy, and I say, hey, I'm going to be going, to, I'm going to be in Kenya. If you were to bring something back home to your family, what would you bring? And the woman said, socks. Wow. But again, I just want to highlight this. You're the kind of person, first of all, to be, that's aware of that, saying, I'm not just going to go be a tourist. Yeah. Second of all, you called the embassy. Yeah, yeah. No one does that. <laughs> well, they should. Mr. Winfrey, <laughs> no one does that. No, they'll find but, out a lot. But it's great. Yeah, I yeah. love it. I yeah, love yeah. that you do that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So she told me to bring socks. So I brought socks. Dude, I'm telling you, I brought Nike socks. Oh. With the swooshes. Okay. And quarters like I'm wearing right now. I, know, I don't know if I can say Yeah. But I'm wearing the quarters. And what I realized... And she had said this to me. She says, when you get there, they have no socks. They're all wearing sandals or they're wearing shoes that they slip their feet into. And they just don't get to experience socks. really expensive to buy socks for them, for, for people. So I go over there and I have a bag, like a duffel bag of socks, right? And my wife thinks I'm crazy, right? She's like, what do you, you know? I have this duffel bag over my shoulders. And I'm walking through the streets of Mombasa in Kenya. And young man comes up to me and he says, speaks pretty good English. He says, would you like me to take you on a tour? I said, what's it going to cost me? And the funny thing over there, they don't know the difference of dollars. So they just say it's a oh. dollar. It's going to cost you a dollar. They don't understand the concept of it all. Right. They just want some money to work and sure. he's going to show me around. Right. I say to him, listen, I'm not going to give you a dollar. I'm going to give you a pair of socks. You thought I'd given this guy the world. Hmm. He says, really? And I unzipped it thing and i open it up like this i said pick your pair he reaches in and grabs a pair i zip it back up and he's with me for the rest of the day oh my goodness right we went everywhere he takes his my wife, he's taking to some back corner or whatever my wife's like i don't like this i said relax this guy's okay he's got socks she goes no he now knows you have a box yeah socks. yeah you're carrying the bag <laughs> always, you've got the bag full of socks this gonna take you to the this is a day. payday yeah i was for like somebody. trust me baby you'll be he'll be okay yeah see right there yeah though so, i want to pause on that <laughs> because i think every reasonable <laughs> rational person would have the reaction that your wife would have yeah you're like nah relax baby yeah because i can take care of myself well and that's too that's a, you, you know you get yourself back into a corner yeah, you, you got get, some I could you get got myself some skills yeah, yeah 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 but i want you to know that whole day i gave socks away i did not buy mm. one thing with a dollar everything was bought with socks oh, that's a, right that's, i love it that's crazy is it yeah, not I all right it. that's just one story i'll tell you another story that my buddy we're going to fiji we're going to do a dive boat so i land in fiji and I forget the name of the main town, the main city there, whatever it is. And I, I come off the airplane and I'm talking to these guys that, that are giving us a ride, whatever. And I said, hey, man, what do these guys out here in this island need? And the guy says to me, he says, pigs. I said, what, a pig? Hmm. He goes, yeah, a pig. I said, you're telling me if I buy a pig and give it to the chief, that's a good thing. Because they have chiefs there, right? And they have medicine okay. men. Because ultimately I was trying to find a medicine man. Okay. That's why I was going, right? Ultimately I was trying to find a medicine man. And so I say to him, you tell me I just got to buy a pig? He goes, yeah. So I go to this market, right? Now, my buddy is with his wife, and he thinks I'm crazy. He's okay. going, going sure. and he says, you know, where are you going? I said, I'm going to the market, buy a pig. 
<laughs> so I go to this market, right? This guy takes me to this market, and I buy a pig. But I bring this pig to this boat, all right? And I'm determined to get this pig on this boat. <laughs> Because I'm just visualizing this. Like, is this a big pig? Is this... it's like, again, it's in a cage. Like, you know, it's probably a 25 pound pig. It wasn't a full grown pig. Okay. It was like a, but I don't want to say it was a piglet. It wasn't a little bitty baby. It was, okay. a, it was like a middle, you know, like a adolescent pig. <laughs> but it's in a cage, right? And the, they bring it, you know, I got it to come to the pier and everybody that's going to be on that boat. And I only know three people that are going to be on that boat. Everybody else is sitting there seeing this dude try to bring this pig on this boat. Well, everybody's going crazy, right? And all of a sudden, the captain of the boat comes out. And he says, what are you doing? He says, we can't have a pig on the, on the ship, on, on the boat. And I said, listen, we're going to stop on one of these islands, right? And he says, yeah. I said, I, I want to give it one of these chiefs to, on the island a pig because they said these need pigs. He says, no one's going to let us on an island. We don't get to go on the island. He says, we get to uh, moor next to the island and dive around the island, but we can't get on the island. They don't let any Caucasians on the island, right, is what he called it. And I was like, really? And so the guy who showed me where to go get the pig is hearing this whole story. And so he finally says to me, he says, hey, I have a cousin that has a boat that will bring your pig to this island, right? (laughs) Okay. So I say to the captain, are we going to this island? He goes, well, we're going to dive near the island, but we're not going to the island. All right. I said, okay, that's fine enough to me. I'm going to go give this guy a pig. And then that's just that. So I asked the guy, hey, I'll give you money. Make sure this pig gets there. So this guy takes this pig to this island. Five days later, we're near this island. A boat comes out. An island boat comes out. Okay. With these dudes riding like, like, right. a, like Polynesian guys, you know? Rowing. Like, uh, rowing. And they come to the side of the boat. And they say, our chief would like to invite all of you to the island. <laughs> and then you went to the island and you and saw then the I chief. went to the island. And you know what the, what the chief did? The chief, through a party, roasted the pig that he had on the island for us. And we're on the, the captain of that boat could not believe that we got on that island. He's like, I cannot believe. He says, I'm asking all the time. I said, well, you got to bring a pig every once in a while, bro. You got to bring a pig. And I want you to know, everybody <laughs> else that was on that boat who was giving me a hard time, when we got to that island and they saw all the island, it was the best dang thing they ever did. That was the best. That was the number one thing happened on that trip. But yes, we did some cool diving. Maybe in their life for some of those people. Some of the people. Right? right, we drank kava with them. We had a great time. We we're king singing, dancing, all the stuff. Right, <laughs> and and because this guy got a pig, somebody gave. Somebody gave. Oh something. yeah, exactly. The right? gift. The gift is what created that. The gift is what created oh, that. Man. That's where I was going with that story. Wow. With you, right, it's the gift. Not to think about, you know, all the silly stuff that you know. Yeah, I want to go to the island. So yeah, you're gonna pay the guy some money. He doesn't need the money. For you to go to his island, he lives on an island. He needs a pig. Yeah, and also, I mean, <laughs> what a story to make this point. But the other point is too, and it kind of goes back to what you're doing with your wife, right? Mm-hmm. It's the awareness of what they want. Mm-hmm. You're giving the gift yeah. of what they want. Yeah, that's true, right? Yeah, because you're it. asking that question. You have that awareness yeah. to put it in terms of. The, I mean, I know that's not always what happens with you, but yeah. in, in those cases, that's what it was. Well, again, the idea is I learned a long time ago is to give. Yeah. Right. Don't be a taker. Mm. Right. And again, I was also trying to see a medicine man, but that's what I learned from a medicine man was that come with gifts. Don't be the guy who comes in and just trying to take what you take something from me, take my knowledge or take whatever come and bring something. And so again, you know, how do you be inclusive? How do you give, you know, you got to give something before you can get something. And, um, I, I believe in that. I don't know. I don't know if I, I, I don't think I say it as cleanly as you do. And I, I don't know if I practice it like that. I just practice it accidentally kind of thing. Well, you know I don't think it's, I don't think it's maybe, um, as thoughtful, Yeah. but it's not accident. Yeah. It's, it's because of that primary aim you, yeah. you have, yeah. which is to live deeply. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And you, mm-hmm. you interpreting that the way that you do that, mm-hmm. you create situations like this you create mm-hmm. these wonderful stories and moments that i think a lot of people miss out yeah 
as you're telling these stories, I try to think of things that I've done and I think that I'm being adventurous and maybe I'm borrowing a little bit of your adventure, <laughs> but it's not anywhere close to Dave Winford. Oh, it's not funny. the same. <laughs> I tell you, I'll tell you this last story just because it's about my wife. Okay. I hope you'll give me a chance to tell yes, my wife. Yes, please. So, we're on a Greek island and I want to say we're like on Mykonos or something. And we leave the hotel and we start walking. And as we're walking, we're looking for a place to eat. And as I'm walking up this hill, I see this beautiful home with like these tables outside. They're made up like, like for sitting, like people were, you know, made up for dinner. Okay. So I said to my wife, oh, look, this is a nice restaurant. Let's go on in here. She goes, that's not a restaurant. I said, come on, baby. Look at that. There's like 12 tables there. 12 tables, flowers on them, the plates and silverware and cloth. And see, crazy. That's a freaking restaurant on the side of this mountain here, right? On the side mm. of this hill. <laughs> so I, so she pauses for a second and I walk through the door. And as I walk through the door, this beautiful Greek woman. And she says <laughs> in her broken English, may I help you? And I said, of course, yes. I said, table for two. <laughs> 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 and she says, oh, no, you've made a mistake. This is not a restaurant. This is my home. And we're going to have dinner with my family here. And I'm like, going, oh, oh, I'm so sorry. I, I, it was so beautiful. I'm telling her all this stuff. And she looks at me. She says, is it just you and your wife? And I say, yes. And she says, come have dinner with us. Wow. We had dinner. We had food, dancing, singing. I mean, what a wonderful time for, from a knucklehead who just walks through the door. What an experience. <laughs> well, and and let's use this to tie things yeah, up. Yeah, of course. To bring it back yeah. to a kid in Texas. Yeah, yeah. Poor whose guy. family had never been to college. No. Who wanted to be a lobbyist. Yeah, 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 yeah. Poor. Didn't know anything. What a know? story. What a, what a, yeah. what a remarkable life yeah. you're, yeah. you're living. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Always you know, like, normally I like to ask people at the end of this, yeah. where do you see things going? But I know right now you're figuring that out, right? You're figuring out yeah. what the next stage is for you. So maybe you don't. I don't it, have it fully figured out right now. I know yeah. I'm going to be alive. I know I'm going to be always alive. That part's going to be there. My primary aim is going to be there. Yeah. So I don't know where, where the next stage, what that means to me, uh, you know, because I just spent a big portion of my life building a life that was going to be built for, with my wife and I. So mm, we were going to yeah. be doing other things, continue to do the things we we're doing, but we would just be doing them together. And so I have to figure that out. So I, I don't have an answer that's clean, but maybe other people might have an answer that's cleaner than that. I know there's love out there. Yeah. Well, and I know that whatever you do, yeah. it's going to be remarkable because it always is. No, I'll try to make it as fun as right. possible. But to bring it back to your point, we'll try to make it as fun as we possibly can. Yeah. Because that's what we're here to do, right? Yeah. Have us fun and, and live life and be deeply alive and, while you might have some regrets about certain things, you know, hopefully there's just few and far from between, you know, it's more about you live large, you live, you were alive. And I'm really feeling that it's important for me to make sure that my kids now, again, which are young adults, they don't have their mother anymore. So I have to have to be that kind of an example. Uh, so they see it down the road. So that's that. I don't want to end on a crying moment, but that's what it is. So I, so it's I know, a beautiful, it's a beautiful moment. Though. Yeah, yeah. So I, yeah, it is. Yeah, so it I, is because I know the impact that you have in their life, and you know maybe they're going to start their family soon. And you're going to yeah. have the impact in those families. Yeah. So I know whatever it is yeah. that that you do, mm -hmm. you're going to change. A lot of people's lives and make love to people's lives, Richard. Yeah, hopefully we have, impact, have a beautiful impact. That's all we can do to each other, right? Yeah. Just like you've had a beautiful impact on me, so I greatly appreciate this, that you allow me, you know, you wanted to, well, you asked me, you invited me to do this. Yeah. That's kind of you. And we've had a long relationship. I tease, tease you all the time, you know, two dudes on a rock, man. Yeah. Yeah, so that's We didn't story. mention that story. That yeah. was just, you know, <laughs> us hanging out in San Francisco, mm -hmm. what, uh, 25 20, yeah, ish least, years ago? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sitting on rocks after going to Borders Bookstore on a Mind Your Own Business Day. Yeah. And then... Uh, Saying, hey, what do you want to do? Yeah, what are we going to do in the future? Yeah, where and are you going to be, man? Look at what we, what look, we are what now. You did. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for you're sharing welcome. this gift of your story and your wisdom with everyone. Yeah, you're welcome. So I mentioned this before. This is what I do in every episode. I want to pull out a few actions. Okay. All right. Because everyone listening to this, it's not just about the story that you've heard, which truly is inspiring. And you're going to learn a lot. You're going to remember this <laughs> hopefully forever. 
but let's talk about something that you can do. One specific step or action that you can take as a result of what you heard from my friend David Winford. So, gosh, how am I going to pull out three in an interview like this? But I'm going to try to do my best. I'm going to pick three that stand out to me. These aren't the only ones. Yeah, yeah. And then if you'd like to add one or two at the end of that. Yeah. We're looking for granular action steps that someone can do immediately. Yeah. So, gosh, the first one is take the time to identify your core values your primary aim, your terms of victory, whatever you want to call it, write something down, sit down and think about it. And you don't have to get it right the first time. I think that's really important. Like some there is no right or wrong, Dave. Right. Cheers. It's just the next draft. Yes. It's just the next draft. So, so create a first draft of it mm-hmm. and use that, kind of think about over the next couple of weeks and say, how can I use this to guide my decisions? Mm-hmm. Dave used the, that principle of living deeply to guide his decisions. So I think that that's a great one. So the next one I would say is structure your time in a way that creates uh, opportunities to spend time on what's most valuable. Yeah. So if, you, if that's a relationship, that's your family, make that your first business and say, how am I going to carve out time for this? And I know sometimes people are listening to this and, and maybe it's tough. Maybe they've got to work a couple of jobs right now. But you can start by scheduling what's most valuable, what's most important in your life first mm-hmm. and then structure everything around it. Mm-hmm. And even if you can only spend a half an hour a day on that thing, mm-hmm. start with that Yeah, and structure your life to make that happen. And then the third one is give a gift. Mm-hmm. Man, we heard that a few times, right? The gentleman who gave you the flashcards, mm-hmm. right? Gift. The Navy SEAL, he gave you mm-hmm. a gift. Mm-hmm. You gave him the gift of that vision mm-hmm. of being in a, a scuba instructor. Mm-hmm. You gave the gift of the socks in, mm-hmm. in Kenya, right? Mm-hmm. All, just that whole idea of giving to people, the pig, mm-hmm. the pig to the mm-hmm. chief, right? Yeah. Ask yourself today, those who are listening, say, what's one gift? It doesn't have to be expensive. It doesn't have no. to be big. It can just be a kind word. It can just be giving some of your insight to say, ask yourself, what's a gift I can give to someone today? Yeah, think about it. I wrote my wife a card. That's a gift. Yes. I gave Thank my wife you. flowers. That's a gift, right? Mm. Those kinds of things yes. are just small, that small. You know what I'm saying? You know, taking a kid to get an icy. You know what I'm saying? Hey, you come home, it's a hard day. Hey, Gabe, that's my son's name. Hey, Gabe, you want to go get an icy? Well, really? Yeah. Simone, you want to go? Yeah. Mm. Take off and go get an icy. Right? Today, you brought home the dried candy. I thought it was a beautiful gift because there they are. Oh, all for, for our kids up. from the game. <laughs> they're, <laughs> they're all trying to the dehydrate. That's a gift. I think, we, I think we have to think about that more often. And so that would be a great, those are three great action steps. I just also would say to people, think strategically about your life. Be conscious of what you're doing with it. You know, don't live by accident. Live, live intently, mm. right? Have some attention and intention, right, to the way you want to be. And just try to do that a little bit every day. It doesn't mean you have to, you know, I, I'm no monk, trust me. I just try to do those little things as much as I can when I can do them. I just say that we got to have more attention and, in, and intention to our life. And on a practical step, what's one third, something that maybe who ha- someone who hasn't been living strategically or intently, what's one little thing that they could do to move themselves closer to that? Get cleaner about, again, scheduling things or, mm. get, you know, be, be more, uh, more clear about how you're going to spend the time you have, right? Starting with one thing yeah. this, this coming week. Yeah, whatever it may be, whatever that one thing may be. I, I would make it crazy. I would make it something that's, that's important to you or something that you get, brings you joy. Whatever that word is that you that motivates you to do it, I think that's the action step that you've got to take with it. And what you're looking for is the little bitty successes so that way you can see that it's working and you start to shift your thinking and then all of a sudden it becomes a part of who you are. So that's those are the things I would add Beautiful. to that kind of thing. But I agree with you. You know, take action. That's all I got. Someone do. wants to get in touch with you. What's the best way to do that? LinkedIn, the website. Well, you can see me on LinkedIn, Dave Winford. Uh, you're David G. Winford. I'm David on LinkedIn. G. Winford yeah. on LinkedIn. And then, we'll link to that in the show notes. Uh, brother, friend, yeah. Yeah. thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you so thank much you. for this gift that you. They didn't have this headset. Everyone. I give you a hug, but I got the headset. Yeah, no, that's fine. <laughs> that's fine. And you know, everyone listening, thank you for giving us and giving my friend David Winford the opportunity to share his story in your life. And uh, don't just hear it; do something about it. Go have a great week. 
You've been listening to the Dave Crenshaw Success Project, hosted by my dad, Dave Crenshaw, and produced by Invaluable Incorporated. Sound editing was done by my brother, Stratton Crenshaw. Research and assistant production by Victoria Bidez. Voiceover by me, Darcy Crenshaw. And the music is by Ryan Brady via Pond 5 Licensing. Please subscribe to the Dave Crenshaw Success Project on Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you like to get your podcasts. And please don't forget to leave us a five-star review. See you next time.